Welcome to Real Money Talks. Real strategies from the money makers and the world changers that you can use to make millions, keep those millions, multiply your wealth, and build your team. Here's your host, author of five New York Times bestsellers, money expert on Dr. Phil, CNN, CNBC, The Street TV, Fox News, and The View, Laurel Langmire. Hi, this is Laurel, and welcome back to Laurel's Real Money Talks, the podcast that talks about how to make money, how to help people keep it, learn to invest it, and how to use the team properly. So at any time, you can go to askworld.com and ask questions. You can ask questions, make a request during uh, any of our podcasts, and to get access to any of my guests. So I've been doing a lot of just extraordinary folks in the uh, guest category today. My guest knows a lot about making money investing money. Very, very successful. He started an extraordinary group here in the Phoenix area and is moving it across the nation. Those of you who are worldwide, maybe some point will go international with David, but he started and founded Alliances. So David Kogan, welcome to uh, Laurel's Real Money Talks podcast. Thank you so much. And Laurel, I appreciate it and very honored to be on your show and very excited. So David, talk a little bit about your background. The Alliance is one of the chapters of your life, but talk a little bit about where you're from, how you arrived being such a successful entrepreneur. Well, my background is originally from Chicago, and after undergraduate school, was fortunate enough to be required and the ability to work for a large Fortune 5 company, and that was uh, IBM, and worked and lived in Atlanta had an amazing experience. And after that, I uh, was recruited to another company, which was at the time a big three accounting firm, which happened to be Arthur Anderson. And the wealth of experience having worked for those two companies really helped to pave the way of uh, being successful and uh, being able to start a number of successful companies. So is your background then accounting? What is your kind of core competency? Great question. So my undergraduate had nothing to do with accounting. Then I ended up going and getting an MBA, which was funded by IBM, and uh, had nothing to do with accounting. And not even that great with numbers, but I certainly know how to make money. And uh, I was uh, with Arthur Anderson in their business process division, which basically helped to go into a number of companies, which I knew nothing about, and helped really streamline that process. And I think that's a key thing and is whatever business somebody has, whether your listeners have you know small business, large business or that, is really a process. Because once you get that process going, you know, if you've got it tight, you could turn business into like an ATM machine. So what are some of the businesses since Arthur Anderson to Alliances? Uh, what were some of the startups? Because I do want to talk quite a bit about startups. I think that's a big conversation that you uh, can help our audiences and paved the way through? Well, yeah, I started a number of companies. One of the companies that I started, which was interesting, I always had a passion for electronics. And so I started a company that was an online company that sold mid-range speakers. And I was very fortunate because after doing an extensive amount of research, which again, when you're doing a startup, is to do that research. Especially with the internet, there is a wealth of information that's out there. And I started a company, which I had a contract with, of the manufacturer that was based out of Canada. And what happened is, as soon as I started that, and I had an agreement with them, the next thing I know is one of the major magazines featured them as being the top mid-range speaker system. So the next thing I know, I'm flooded with all these orders coming in, because I'm the one that was the ability to have it and sell it and do it within the U.S., And that just expanded it to a lot of other areas within electronics. Next thing I know, I'm attending the Consumer Electronics Show, working and meeting these top executives and founders of all these companies, all from having started it in a bedroom and started a number of other companies. Actually, I think my bedroom seems to be pretty famous because I started an import and export company. So, Laurel, I was dealing with high-end brands like Prada. Louis Vuitton, Gucci, and those authentic brands and reselling them to other people who were then selling them online and selling them in stores and different facets. So uh, it's been quite an amazing ride and the ride still continues. And I'm so passionate about 
startups and about businesses. And by the way, too, is this my background when it came to luxury items about as far away as could be. Never had a really mm-hmm. passion for that. But when I saw the demand of it, you end up building that passion. Seeing other people be happy with what you're providing, that's the key to success. Just like what you do, Laurel. You've got people that are listening intensively to you and to your guests because they know the quality that you provide. Yep. So let's jump forward to alliances. I think uh, your background and the diversity that you provide really kind of allows, doesn't alliances provide you the opportunity to kind of bring it all together and from business process to the networking to, I mean, your collective experience? It sure does. So alliances is a community of entrepreneurs. And who in what we have that are part of alliances are people who are billionaires, people who are millionaires, celebrities, amazing, incredible people like you who are part of alliances, inventors, startups, people that are living in their car starting their business. It's by invite only. And what happens is, is when you get all these amazing people that really share, if I can get in on one specific thing, it is that they have a passion and they love what they do. And each one comes from so many different industries, but you get them all together in a room, the magic happens. So unlike what you know, many people may think is like networking, where everybody's there passing out their business cards, and then it's like, okay, you leave, you have all these business cards, what do you do next? This is really the process where it's a community, where people are coming together, and it's what people can give and help provide to others. And it is literally across the board of people who are part of it. We just had a grand table. You, uh, Laurel, were at uh, yep. one of our recent grand tables. We just had one where we had the co-founder of Oculus there who sold his company for a couple billion dollars to Facebook, along sitting next to the co-founder of Priceline, along sitting next to the world record holder for motorcycles, and so on and so on. So you get these people together, magic truly happens, yet they're from different industries. And so um, that's what Alliances is. We're right now based in Phoenix, Arizona, but we have many people flying in from all over to attend many of our various events that take place, believe it or not, every single week. Absolutely. So So talk about, I know you have a a great process, again, being a process-driven person, which I think most great entrepreneurs are. Talk about the process you take people through to create that magic at Alliances, because Having attended your event, I've attended many, many events, but you have a very specific get, got, go, and just some of the systems that you put in place that you think create that glue to the community. Well, when we had started, and basically what it is, is amazing people are coming together. And what I have found is, is that no matter who somebody is, when they come to that part, the elevator speech, for example, that's old school. So what Alliances has developed now is is the 3G methodology, and that helps people, whether they're presenting in front of uh, the Alliances community or really out and about. And it's the 3G, and it's what you've got. So really, you know, what do you have? What's your give? So what are you looking to do to help others? What can you give? And everybody has something to be able to give. And of course, the final is, is the get. So what things, what tools, what things do you need? And so we have that type of a structure. So when people are going around and they're presenting, they're presenting their 3G. That's how people are taking notes on it. And that's how they're able to connect. So it goes straight to the meat of it. And it's a very successful process. Our roundtables, for example, that we hold every week that changes every week. And Laurel, I got to tell you too, is is that we have now had over 250 roundtables. That's five years every week a round table, and every week we have been full. So your listeners are going, well, what does that mean? That means there's a reason why. And it changes every week because it's where relationships are developed and business deals get made. Yeah, because of that type of success yep. that people are continuing coming uh, and they want to be part of alliances. So it's truly amazing. In other words, you can be in a room. You don't know who that person is sitting next to you. Suddenly they're standing up and they're number 64 wealthiest person in the U.S. And the other person next to you, you know what? They could be an inventor and they're creating their first product and they need resources and help to be able to get that launched. 
And so in your experience, is there a lot of follow-up that the individuals do by themselves? I mean, I know you allow, I mean, there's a lot of networking, a lot of contact details, you know, going back and forth. But are there, you know, I say success stories or situations where the members have collaborated or come together to form other businesses? What's the kind of outcome of the community and in their experience? All the time, I hear a ton of stories. In fact, on our website at eliances.com, and that's E-L-I-A-N-C-E-S dot com, we have over a thousand testimonials. And so I'll give you a couple of various examples as we had two people that are in the franchise industry, both, you would say, competitors. They got together. They ended up launching their own type franchise together. We have another one. We had the uh, founder of Dippin' Docs. Oh, that's awesome. Founder of Dippin' Docs came to Alliances. He's now working with four or five now, I believe, other Alliances members. Various things on launching because he's launching a new product, which is just phenomenal. That's like a dip in dots, but absolutely phenomenal. And he needed an SEO person. So now they teamed up and they're working together. I helped him launch one of his products actually at one of the food fairs that took place. And there I am passing out these new things, helping him out, getting him situated, getting him into the fair and all that. And it's like the rock star of the founder of Dippin Dots. I'm like, he's right behind. They're all like, wow. So it's everybody coming together and help. And it's not just within helping business, but it's the overall part. We have a number of people now that have joined other people's boards. Banks have been established. So the bank boards uh, have been established. We now have over 30 alliances members that sit on bank boards. And there's a Veterans Bank Board, for example, that's starting, where there's a number of Alliances members now that are going to be part of that. So it's the success story. Is, it's absolutely phenomenal. And I hear so much. It, it almost becomes overwhelming on my part because I like to call it the beyond networking. Yeah. Instead of going into a room, I mean, Laurel, you're very comfortable. You're very comfortable within your skin, but not everybody is. And some people are you know, they may not be, but being able to come to alliances, we make sure that everybody in that room is comfortable. We make sure it's the oasis for entrepreneurs. I almost like to call it the Disneyland experience. So think of it when you go to Disneyland. No, it's true. Like if you go to Disneyland, if you're an adult or you're a child or you're a newborn or you're a senior, they make every experience there. I mean, you go out of there, you're just like, this is amazing, right? So they really target all of it at once. So how can that happen at alliances when you have entrepreneurs from all these different backgrounds coming together? So it's not an association. So it's not the engineering association, the realtors association, all that. It's alliances. Exactly. David, let's switch gears to some startups. So when you think about the startups you've done or that you're seeing done within your community of alliances, what are some of the, I'm going to say processes or guidelines that you give to the folks as you're in a startup conversation? Because I think those, I mean, as we know, having done many of them, there's a lot of challenges and diversity to each of those challenges, depending on the industry you're starting. But just in general, what are some of those guidelines and processes to do a startup properly? Well, I started a number of startups and I started from scratch. Let me tell you about the last business, which was in the healthcare field. Again, nothing about the healthcare field started a company. And when you're starting off, really, it's you doing everything. And the advice, because I'm also a mentor within the Arizona State University, so I'm one of their um, entrepreneur mentors, uh, helping out a number of startups and, and students with that, is while we like to think that some of our roadblocks and some things may be unique, guess what? They're not. And there are a lot of challenges that take place of doing a startup. And I'd like to know is, is, and I know this may sound a little bit crazy, but if I knew what I knew before getting into it, I probably would have never even started a company. If I knew about the amount of work and I knew of the amount of working with customers, working with employees and that, I would have been so scared. But what I learned most is, is that, and the guidance that I give to with startups is you just have to do, you have to do and you have to move forward and to develop those processes along the way, because in the end, nobody's going to know it better than you. And the key thing is, is that it has to have a revenue model. If you do not have a revenue model, you do not have a business. If you have a nonprofit and you do not have a revenue model to get money in to support that nonprofit, it will not last. 
And I can't tell you how many people that I speak to and they want to do good. And I think that's great and amazing. And it's like, okay, what's your revenue model? I don't know. If you don't know what your revenue model is, it will not last no matter what it is, whether it's a club, whether it's a group. I mean, look at even education systems. Everything is a revenue model. You have to have it in order to sustain. Your listeners may find this interesting. Give you a short story. Yeah. So when I started a healthcare company, I was out there banging on doors to be able to get calls in. And what it was, it was a company that we took care of the convalescent and disabled and seniors. So we sent people out to care of them in facilities and, and homes. And we sent people out. So I started and I was banging on doors and I was getting calls in. So I was so excited. I couldn't believe people were actually calling because they wanted the service. So the next step was you had to go out there and do the evaluation. And that happened to be me. So I'll never forget this, Laura. I did 10 evaluations. So that means I go out to each person. I do the evaluation and I either sign them up or I don't. All 10 said no. So I thought to myself. Yeah, I was going to say, right? Those are the days where you have to adjust quickly. They, they all said no. So I thought to myself, that's it. I'm in the wrong industry. Nobody likes me. This is insane. I made the biggest mistake. Meanwhile, I invested, you know, a lot of money, a lot of time, a lot of energy, things that would never come back. So I'm like, this is it. I need to walk. So I thought to myself, and I was sitting at the desk, and I was like, okay, and I have, you know, I have a couple of children that I have to support, and I'm just at odds, and I didn't know what to do. So, Laura, what do you think I did? Any idea? Boy, I could go a lot of directions. It's called a mentor, continued, shifted your revenue model, which direction? Yep. And those are awesome, awesome ideas and suggestions. So here's <laughs> what I ended up doing. I began my call with the first one who said no. And I simply picked up the phone as nervous as could be. And I said something to them along like this. I understand that you didn't pick the company and that's fine, but I'm calling to understand why. And then I just let oh, the yeah. phone go silent. I let it go silent. In fact, it was so silent that you'd be surprised if you are silent on the phone or you are silent in a conversation, People will continue. They'll carry on. And I did it with each one. And I listed it out. And they must have thought I was crazy because finally, by the time I got to the ninth one, I had it you know, down. And it was giving them an out, right? Hey, listen, it's a non-threatening. You know, I understand you didn't pick me. They had to pick somebody. So this was the type of service. Like they had to do something. They had to do something. And then I was able to analyze it, figure out those things, and fix it. And then from there on, I had about an 80 to 90% closure rate going forward. But this rule applies. This is no different than whether you have accountants out there that are listening now, lawyers that are listening now. If they're not getting the business, they have got to go to the source. They have to understand why. Why are they not? Why are they not getting it? Exactly. What was some of the feedback that you heard that you then shifted because of that conversation? So the feedback, some of it I couldn't fix. So, for example, um, I remember one that said, well, we're more comfortable talking with a female. Okay, I, you know, that, that I couldn't fix. And, and I was surprised, even though it wasn't doing matter in regards to the services. So it was just that. Some of it was in regards to age because I looked more young at that time. But the other things I were able to fix was, one, being attentive. So it was being so focused on what they were saying more than anything else. So what this taught me is, is now, when I go into any meetings or even on the phone now, anything of that, I am now always taking notes. Whether I'm jotting down something or that, I'm taking notes on whatever's being said from the fact is this because it's showing true intent of what they're saying and capturing each and every single word, understanding the need. So instead of being in a cell state, and I think this is what led to the whole thing what you mentioned earlier about alliances and our 3G methodology, was to be so focused in on what the person needs and what you think possibly they may need versus trying to sell. Because Laurel, you're so experienced at what you do. You provide the most valuable information that people need to be able to make money, keep their money, save their money, that it's not a selling thing. It's like, this is what it is. This is what you've got. And being confident with it, along with not being cocky. Big difference, isn't it? In fact, it got to it where when someone didn't select my healthcare company, I would go into shock to say, well, well, think about it. My response is like, as if I heard it for the first time, like, think about it. 
what's to think about? You need the service, you need it now. It's almost, it's the same thing. Somebody's going and seeing a lawyer, they're going to a consultation. They're not there to just kind of figure it out. They need help. And if they're not signing up with that lawyer or that accountant now, something is wrong. Yep. I would challenge your audience. I would challenge those that are in those type of professions. If they're not getting the client, how many of them have called up and said, why? And then just leave it. Let them talk until it goes to dead airspace and the person says, "Um, are you there? And the answer should be yes. I'm just taking intensive notes so that I can learn for the future. Mm, That's good. So uh, let's go to the other side of startups. What would be two or three things that you would tell someone that is heading into a startup business, clearly, uh, you know, a revenue model, a sales process, what are the things that they wouldn't know to ask that you need to know? First of all, everything is going to be more expensive than you thought it's going to be. <laughs> whatever price, really, whatever it is, yeah. is more expensive. So you need to be resourceful about that. There's no reason to go out and start getting a fancy, you know, chairs and fancy desk and all that. In fact, I knew I had to move out of the house when business got so big and I got so frustrated that I once threw a shoe at a door and I was like, okay, it's time for me to leave. The second thing is, is that regardless of whatever price you put on your product or your service, it's always the wrong price. It's always the wrong price. It doesn't matter what it is. It's always the wrong price. So you have to kind of figure out and feel out the market of what is going to work, what you feel is going to work. But you know, you can analyze all the data, all the stuff that you want in the world, but it's never going to be like the right price. So you have to always adjust and really being able to read and be in tune and be flexible. So with the startups is, is and what's amazing and with the startups that I've done, in fact, even with alliances, is being able to shift, like you never thought you would do this now. You never thought you would do that now. It's like accountants that, you know, they're starting off, they have their own practice, and then now they're starting to do some advisory services regarding investments, right? They may never have thought originally, okay, I'm going to focus on doing the accounting, the tax part, and now they get the experience. Now they're doing other things for uh, their clients. So I would say always being open and being flexible. One of the last things is is to understand that, and I said it a little bit earlier, is that anything you're going through, somebody else is going through it. Surround yourself with experience, with incredible people, people who have done it, people who are skilled at communicating with people like you. Mm. So, David, tell us, what has surprised you the most about what you're doing? What surprised me most is the incredible people that I've had the privilege of being able to meet, again, including you, and that our community, those that are part of alliances, have been able to meet, too. I mean, it's almost like the people that I have met, in the end, everybody really is down to earth. And we're all people, right? At the end of the day, we're all people. And I've heard people say to me, well, you know, everybody goes to the bathroom. Everybody has to go to the bathroom, et cetera, et cetera. (laughs) But at the end of the day, it really is that. And I've taken a whole nother perspective of it. I've been able to meet, you know, President of the United Nations of the General Assembly, I've spoken with him to founder of Fitbit, to Craig from Craigslist, or Angie from Angie's List. And in fact, I wanted to get those two together, right? That would have been an interesting story. That would have been a successful story to share, right? Angie from Angie's List and Craig from Craigslist. Yeah, and the list just goes on and on. And it's not a bragging part. It's just to say that everybody is human. And at the end, we all feel the same emotions. We all feel the same emotions. You know, we all get nervous at different things. We all are comfortable with certain things. Everybody has fears. Some people have more fears than others. And I think that some of the fears still carry over. I've spoken with people who have had nothing, who are afraid, you know, that they're going to be on the street. And then the same people who have everything and who have enough from generation after generation, guess what? They still have that type of fear because it could all go in a matter of a heartbeat. And that's the thing, too, is, is I think what you help and what you teach is, you know, how to secure that, right? How do you secure it? And you have experts that can help with all that because it seems like now with one thing we do wrong, boom, it could all be over. Let me share one other thing, too, that I think your audience will really find interesting. Since I was in the healthcare field, I worked with a lot of people that are on hospice. And those are people that are, you know, going to be passing very soon, typically within, I believe, it's under three months. and. There's been studies out there, and I also asked some because they were clients and they were cognitive at the time, and I would ask them, 
is there anything that you wish you would have done that you haven't done? So again, these are people that are being passing away and stuff of that. Yeah. And in a roundabout way, what they all had to seem to have in common in one way or another was the following. They wish they took more risks. <laughs> interesting. Yeah. That's an interesting one, huh? Well, again, I think that's true. I think so many people stand on the sideline and think about things and don't do them. And, you know, I always associate the word risk with education or lack thereof. That anything that you don't know about feels risky. So my my message to everybody is just lean in and learn it. If it's interesting to you and also, if you partner up, you reduce your risk substantially by somebody who's already done what you wanted to do. Those are always my two big messages when somebody stands still and won't jump in. You have to do. You're right on. Yeah. Exciting. So I know you have some call to action. If people want to get to know you, understand the alliances as you're starting to spread and you know, franchise really across the nation, how can they you know, learn more about the organization and the opportunity? Where would you like them to go? Absolutely. So if you're someone that has an idea, you're in business, maybe you want to be a mentor, maybe you're starting your company, whatever level it may be, you want to go to alliances.com and that's E-L-I-A-N-C-E-S.com. You could click on Experience Roundtable. We have weekly roundtables where people fly in from all over. We have grand tables, which again, Laurel has been to. We have deal hours that take place. It is beyond anything of networking. It's really, and I don't care what level somebody is at, we hold their hand through this process. And we make it the oasis where people who have a passion for what they do, a passion for life. We even have someone, for example, who is the world record holder, female, oldest female to climb Mount Kilimanjaro. And now she's part of alliances. Now she's in training to become the oldest person to climb Mount Kilimanjaro. And guess what? She's surrounding herself with everybody from alliances. Her trainers are from alliances. The guy that's going to be going out and helping to do the photography, if he makes it to the top, he's with alliances and others. So literally what I'm trying to share with the audience is from all walks of life coming together to help build one another and build the community. David, I just want to acknowledge the work you're doing. Look forward to being more involved and coming back I think I need to come back over the summer and do another one. And you also have a radio show. So um, I was on that. Talk a little bit about that so people can listen. Because that was super fun to be on. And I, I want to come back and do that again. It was so much fun. Absolutely. It would be an honor to have you on. In fact, oh, I got to tell you, Laurel, we played your flash. Okay, your audience needs to know that this is Secrets About Laurel. Within 60 <laughs> seconds. Oh, no, I got to share this, Laurel. I know you told this me that. This was fun, wasn't it? I think I shocked your listeners, you. <laughs> your listeners have to because we played it two weeks ago at our roundtable. And this is where we ask as many questions as we can within 60 seconds. And we asked Laurel these questions. And you have got to go. you got to listen to it. Go to Alliance. This was another incentive for your listeners. We asked her questions. You had everybody on the floor smiling, laughing across it. In fact, I'm not going to share it. But if you want to know the one thing that Laurel must do every day, make sure you go to alliances.com because she will share it and you will be shocked. They would be shocked. I think I, I think you are shocked. So if they go to oh, alliances.com, where do they find uh, that interview? You click on radio and then type in Laurel's name and it'll pop up at the top. So you just go to E-L-I-A-N-C-E-S.com. It is something that nobody knows about Laurel. That is the secret. <laughs> There's a reason why she has a smile on her face every day. And if you go there, you're going to know. Awesome. David, it's great to have you on. Look forward to being back on and I'll have to come up with some new 60 second, you know, conversations. But those of you that are out there, if you want to get in a great community, go to the alliances.com. And those of you that want to talk to David directly, make a, you know, a request, ask me a question, go to ask Laurel, A-S-K-L-O-R-A-L.com. And we'll be back in touch very shortly. Again, weekly podcast. Uh, if you've enjoyed this or any of our podcasts, pass it on. And uh, we're on every podcast channel out there in the world. So, David, thanks. You have a great day. And the rest of you listening, have an extraordinary day. Make a bunch of money. We'll talk next week. Thanks for listening to the Real Money Talks podcast. Your host has been Laurel Langmire, author of five New York Times bestsellers, money expert on Dr. Phil, CNN, CNBC, The Street TV, Fox News, and The View. 
Want to learn more about off Wall Street investing, tax strategies, and multi-million dollar business strategies? Visit liveoutloud.com slash podcast for past episodes, show notes, and resources. For some special wealth building gifts only for Laurel's podcast listeners, visit liveoutloud.com slash podcast gifts. Do you have a burning question for Laurel? Visit asklaurel.com to submit your question, and it may just be covered on a podcast episode. So stay tuned and be sure to subscribe to get new episodes every week. Every week.